professors in biology out there. Um, and, oops, sorry, I'm going to pop up there. <laughs> uh, and I did my thesis research on uh, bat activity when I was there as well. So after I left grad school, I kind of hopped around. I uh, spent some time in Arizona doing bat research. Um, I spent four years in Puerto Rico doing project management uh, and also doing a little bit of bat research there as well. And I came back to Columbus with the division uh, in late 2018. So I've been here just a little over two years now. And my main, my main role at the division is to coordinate and oversee uh, the majority of the state's bat research, including some of our community science programs, which I'll talk about uh, at the end here. So just to go over sort of the flow of how I'm gonna do this, um, I'm gonna spend uh, quite a bit of time, maybe 20 minutes or half an hour or so, just kind of giving you guys a similar presentation to what I would give um, an educational group. So I don't know a whole lot about the OCBN program, but I do know that you guys work with the public um, and you might be giving presentations or might be working with people at nature centers. And so I really want to give you guys the information that I want you to share with the public when you're doing these programs. Um, if you look up things online, like how many species of bats in Ohio, you will get anywhere from 10 to 14 species. Um, some people will say that we have species here that we definitely don't have here. So I kind of want this to serve as the, um, the presentation that you guys will take with you uh, and, and the information that you'll share. So we're kind of all on the same page. So I'll spend some time doing that, talk about the bats that we have in Ohio, talk about their annual cycle, uh, and then move into what the division is doing for bat research, how, um, how I guess other bat researchers do research, um, and then talk about the community science opportunities. And I apologize, I did just give a presentation last week um, as part of our Bat week, week series on Facebook. So if you tuned into that, there is gonna be some repeat information, um, of course, all the, you know, the anatomy of bats didn't change in last week. So I tried to add in a bunch of new stuff so that it wouldn't be me giving the same exact presentation, but there is gonna be a little bit of overlap if you watch that one. Um, so the first thing that I just wanna share is that bats are a super diverse group of animals. There are over, and this is where another figure gets thrown out, anywhere from 1100 to over 1300 species of bats uh, in the world. So you can find them on every continent in the world except Antarctica. Um, and they actually make up 20% of all mammal species. So that's second only to rodents. So they're second most numerous mammal uh, species in the world. And as you can see from these photos, they kind of run the gamut <laughs> in terms of body size, um, shape, coloration, adaptations. Um, there are just tons and tons of different uh, bats in the world. So the largest bat in the world is the uh, golden crown flying fox. It's found in the Philippines. It has a wingspan of five feet, six inches. So it's actually taller than me. Uh, and it weighs only about two and a half pounds. So even though it's a really big bat, it's very light. And then in contrast, that lower picture there, we have the bumblebee bat or the kitty's hognose bat. It's actually the smallest bat in the world and I believe the smallest mammal in the world. So that one has a wingspan of, of only six inches and weighs about set, or 0.7 ounces and that's about the weight of two Skittles. Uh, and then you can see from these photos, again, there's everything in between. So again, just trying to, to show you that bats are a really, really diverse order. There are a couple things I want to point out about the anatomy of a bat that I think are interesting. So bats are in the order Chiroptera, so that literally means hand wing. Um, if you'll notice from this diagram here, uh, looking at the, the wing, it's actually really similar to our hands. So bats do have a thumb. Their thumb is more like a claw, so they can use that when they're um, climbing up trees. And then they have the same fingers that we do. They're just really elongated. And then stretched between that finger is their wing membrane. Uh, the wing membrane it's a little bit leathery feeling. It's pretty thin and light. I always tell people the, the closest thing we have to that is your eyelid. So if you close your eye and you feel your eyelid, that's a little bit what a bat's wing membrane feels like, a little bit thicker. Um, bats also have knees like we do, but the interesting thing is that their knees bend backwards. So if you thought about sitting in a chair, if you sat down, your knees bent the other way where your feet would actually come up and be pointing at the ceiling. Um, so bats knees point towards their back. And then the last thing I want to talk about is just bat teeth. So in the lower right, I've got a picture of a big brown bat. They've got these really sharp teeth. Um, we actually try when we're doing presentations about bats to avoid using photos like this because um, people are kind of afraid of them. They see those teeth and they think about vampire bats and they think, well, they have to have these really sharp teeth to be able to penetrate skin, to be able to um, you know, consume blood. And that is true of vampire bats, but the rest of the bats, especially the bats here in Ohio, they all eat insects. And most of the insects have that really hard exoskeleton that they have to penetrate. So they've just got really sharp teeth so that they can be better about eating uh, bugs. For most of our bats, and something you probably know about bats is that they hang upside down. 
Um, so you might be wondering, how are they able to do that? If we tried to hang upside down for a significant period of time, um, we would not be able to do that. And, and why did they do that? So two things here. Um, again, as I mentioned, even that really large bat, that bat that had over a five foot wingspan only weighs two and a half pounds. So gravity does not impact them the same way that it does us. If we hung upside down, all the blood would start to pool on our heads and in our hands, and we wouldn't be able to do that for very long, um, very safely. But again, bats are really light, so they just don't have that same um, gravitational effect on their blood that we do. They also have specialized valves uh, in their body that help pump blood while they're upside down. And then the other interesting thing is their feet. So if you think about our hands, um, when we're in a relaxed position, our hands are, are open, you know, with our, our palms open, our fingers extended, and it takes us energy if we want to clench and make a fist. Uh, we have to contract our muscles to do that. But bats are actually the opposite. Um, they've got specialized tendons so that when they flip and they hang upside down, their tendons lock into place and actually hold them in this position without them expending any energy. So they don't get tired hanging upside down all day because they're, they're essentially expending no energy. When they want to let go, they actually have to then use their muscles to open their toes and drop down. So that's how they're able to, to hang for long periods of time without getting tired. And actually, a bat that ends up dying while it's hanging upside down will just stay in that position until something knocks it down because it's just the natural position for them to be in. So as for the why, there's a couple different um, theories, I guess. Um, because of the morphology of the bats, they have really light bones. Uh, they're not hollow like bird bones, but they are thin and they're light and they can't support the bats um, if they were to, to sit upward on a branch like a bird does. So they're not able to do that. Um, if a bat is sitting on the ground, think about it's kind of like if we were laying on our stomach on the ground and our arms were out, if you tried to push, to, to push yourself or to sort of simulate flying, you're not gonna be able to do that. You're just gonna hit the floor. So bats really can't take off from a position when they're on the ground. So they need to basically be hanging upside down again because they can't sit on top of a branch. They hang upside down, they drop down into that space below them and that, that's how it's easiest for them to take flight. So that's probably why they've evolved uh, to hang upside down. The last thing I want to touch on, we'll talk about this more later when I talk about acoustics, is echolocation. Again, this is something you're probably all familiar with, but essentially um, the bats will emit ultrasonic um, pulses of noise. Those will bounce off objects or insects in the surroundings and then come back to the bat. And depending on um, how that information comes back, so the signal bounces back and the bat hears it in its left ear first, then it knows that there's an object to its left. Um, if it you know, hears it in its left ear and then it starts moving to the right ear, then the bat knows that that is an insect that's moving in front of it. So this is how um, a lot of bats navigate and insectivorous bats um, will capture their prey. Of course, not all bats echolocate. There are the ones that eat fruit, so their prey is not moving. They don't really need to use the echolocation in order to locate it. And I've got this picture on the right here. These are Honduran white bats, which are one of the most adorable bats in the world, in my opinion. <laughs> but they're really a great example. They've got this weird um, like yellow triangle shaped nose. And that's called a nose leaf. Um, a lot of bats will have this, or you might know of other bats that have um, really wrinkly faces or really strange shaped ears. So we don't know exactly how this works, but the thought is that this aids in echolocation somehow. All those wrinkles, those folds, those big nose leaves somehow help them interpret those sounds um, as it bounces back to them. So that's why you might see some bats that are really uh, strange shaped and why those the things like the flying foxes, the ones that eat fruit, they don't have all those strange face shapes because again, they're not using echolocation. Uh, so before I talk about the bats that we have in Ohio, I just wanna talk about their annual cycle because it'll um, give you some more context when I talk about the individual bats themselves. So um, I'm just gonna go through season by season and tell you what you're gonna find bats doing during each season. So starting here in the summer, that's when bats are gonna be most active and you can divide them into um, sort of two different groups. So first of all, the males are always going to be solitary um, or at least live in small bachelor colonies where there's just a handful of them. And in some species, the females are gonna be colonial. So they'll live in uh, large maternity colonies. Um, and sorry, I heard some sound here. Anne, did you have a question to ask me before I moved on? <laughs> no, you're good, sir. Okay, all right. <laughs> I thought maybe you were unmuting to ask me something. Okay, so we've got the solitary bats and then we've got um, maternity colonies. But there are some species where both sexes are solitary or at least only live in small uh, family groups. So we'll talk about that when we get to the specific bat species. Um, so you can think of them in, in that different way, solitary bats, colonial bats, and then also thinking about um, how they're roosting during the summer. So 
There are some bats that will use the foliage of uh, the trees. So this bat on the upper left here is a red bat and it literally just roosts right um, in clumps of leaves or inside foliage. Uh, and then there are other bats that will use the, the bark of trees. So if you've got peeling bark or you've got trees that have cavities or holes, there are bats that will use those. And then of course there's some bats like in this picture on the right that will use um, as well as natural areas, they also use buildings and things like that. So there are a couple of different things they could be doing um, in terms of roosting during the summer. But regardless of the species, um, all of the bats are gonna have their pups during the summer. So all the bat species only have one litter. So they're only gonna have um, one litter during the whole year. Each litter is generally one to two pups. For some species, it can be three to five, but normally it's, it's just one to two. Um, the pups are gonna be born, depending on the species again and, and time of year, or, or weather, I mean, it's, it's generally mid-May to early August. Uh, the pups are born blind, deaf, and hairless. You can see a good picture on the lower left of a, a big brown bat pup, and then one on the lower right that actually has two pups. Uh, and the pups you might notice are really not that much smaller than the adults. So there's something like 40 to 60% of the, of the weight of the adults. And the interesting thing is that um, the bats will move around during the summer. Uh, they'll move from roost to roost if they have to follow um, insects as they flush throughout the, the landscape. And those females will actually carry those, those pups. So it's really incredible that this female can carry something that's 60% you know, of her body weight while flying. Um, so they're really interesting that way. Uh, and then the pups will be volant, which means they're able to fly towards the end of August. So essentially that's what's going on during the summer. Their um, females are either forming maternity colonies or small family groups. They're having their pups. Um, and of course, all of the bats are eating as much as possible, just building up all their fat reserves um, to prepare for the winter. So going into fall, we actually have some species of bats that are migratory. So this, um, this showing on the upper left here, I guess this is backwards for fall. You'd be going you know, from north down to south, but um, this is the potential movements of hoary bats, which is one of our species. So you can see that these are long distance migrators. We might have bats here in Ohio that are gonna migrate all the way down to Florida to spend the winter. So we've got a couple species that are migratory. Um, even the species that aren't technically migratory, they are gonna move um, from a, a summer ground to a wintering ground. So we might have bats that move in Ohio um, down to Kentucky, or they might just move to another part of Ohio, but they are gonna move some, some distance. Um, the ones that st stick around and are gonna hibernate here, they do a behavior called fall swarming. So if you um, find a, a hibernacula, there might be swarms of bats um, outside of that during the winter or during the fall. The purpose of that is most likely mating. So uh, the reproductive system for bats is interesting in that uh, they actually exhibit what's called delayed fertilization. So they will mate in the fall, but then the female has the ability to store that sperm in her reproductive tract until the spring. Uh, and the reason that is, is because obviously you don't wanna be giving birth in the middle of winter when there's no insects for you to eat. So they mate in the fall, but then the fertilization actually doesn't take place until the spring. We had a quick question on yep. uh, how long are the pups with the mother during that uh, development? Um, so they will be born, like I said, mid-May to, um, to early July, and then they're volant towards the end of August. So just a couple months through the summer. And um, they are completely dependent on the mothers during that time. But then once they're volant and they take off for the fall, they'll separate. Um, so, okay, so we've made it through fall. So now, again, the bats that are migratory, they're gonna be out of Ohio or mostly out of Ohio. Uh, and the bats that stick around are gonna go into hibernation. So uh, the hibernation site is called a hibernacula. We would typically think of a cave or a mine. Um, but bats can also hibernate in things like rock ledges. So we found a lot of what we call above ground hibernacula. If you get um, like a sandstone that weathers in, in kind of a honeycomb thing, there's a lot of different grooves and cracks and places that bats can get up and, and hide in there. They will hibernate above ground uh, sometimes. So uh, just to point out these pictures real fast before I forget, on the left here, this is a group of big brown bats that are um, hibernating in a cluster. In the middle, we have a tricolored bat. And then on the right hand side is a little brown bat. So during winter um, hibernation, it's technically they go into torpor, but I'm just gonna refer to it as hibernation um, just for the sake of simplicity here. But the bat's heart rates normally during the summer, they're gonna be 200 to 300 beats per minute. But during hibernation, they slow that down to 20 to 30 beats per minute. Uh, their body temperature is gonna drop. We found bats that are um, close to freezing. So depending again on the species where they're in that hibernacula, if they're closest to the, to the entrance, it's gonna be really cold and their body temperatures can be almost freezing. And they also slow down their breathing. 
So they might breathe only one time every few minutes. So essentially what they're doing is just shutting down or slowing down their body system so that they're conserving energy. Their metabolism is slowing down. Um, again, there's not really any food available for the winter for things that eat insects. So in order to survive, they need to make sure they're not expending a lot of energy. And I'm gonna take a quick detour before we talk about spring, uh, just to address white nose syndrome because we are talking about winter right now. So I'm sure most of you guys have heard of white nose syndrome, but if you haven't, uh, white nose syndrome is a disease that is caused by a fungus uh, that was thought to be introduced here from Europe in 2006. So what happens is that this, this fungus actually likes the cold as well. So it's in those areas where the bats are hibernating, it's in the caves, it's on the rocks. Uh, and again, because the body temperature of those bats drops, that fungus is then able to colonize the bats. It can just move from the cave um, onto the bats. So you'll see that photo. Um, they've got the white muzzle, it's how it's got its name. But even on their wings and on their ears, you can see that white fuzz. So anywhere they have bare skin, they can get this fungus growing on them. Um, the mechanisms for how it works are, are a little bit complicated, but essentially what it boils down to is that, uh, again, these, these bats have, have reduced their energy usage, but now they're going to have to kind of come out of torpor. They're going to have to ramp up their immune system to try to fight this off. They might wake up uh, because this fungus is irritating, so they'll start grooming themselves, they'll start itching, and basically they're using that stored energy uh, way too quickly. So normally that, you know, they store up enough to get them through the winter and then they keep waking up and, and um, having to restart their metabolism. And it's just causing them basically to, to burn through that fat and to starve to death or dehydrate. Unfortunately, even sometimes if they make it through the winter, that fungus growing on their, their wings can cause holes or tears. It can make it so that they're not able to forage very effectively in the spring. And then they'll, um, even though they made it through the winter, they'll, they'll die in the spring also because they can't, uh, can't get enough food. So just to note here, the main mortality for white nose is again during winter and early spring. So I get a lot of people that call me, they'll find a dead bat in summer and they wanna report it because they think that it's dead from white nose because they know about white nose syndrome. And it's great, like we definitely want you to report um, any dead bats that you find to us, but this is a cold loving fungus. It's not affecting the bats in the summer. So if you find a dead bat in the summer, it's most likely young of the year that just didn't make it, you know, natural mortality, or it could be a variety of other things, but it's most likely um, not gonna be from white nose syndrome. So just to show you a couple maps of the spread here, uh, white nose was originally found in 2006 in New York. So in the upper right there, there's a red circle. Uh, this map is from November of 2010. So I just wanted to show you in you know, just four years how quickly white nose had spread uh, in the Eastern United States. And then this is a really sad map, um, 2020. This is the current um, status of white nose. So you'll notice, unfortunately, we do have this in Ohio. We confirmed it in the state in the winter of 2011 and 2012. It could have been here before that, but that's when we first started seeing uh, mass mortalities and it's just continued to spread. Um, you'll notice we only have a couple counties confirmed in Ohio. Once we confirmed it, we just, uh, because of the nature of the fungus and the nature of the way the bats work, we do assume that it, it is everywhere in the state and we act like it's everywhere in the state. So even though you know not all of Ohio is green confirmed, we, we do consider it to be everywhere. Um, in most of the Eastern United States, we just consider it to be endemic. So we think it's everywhere in the East. Unfortunately, it's jumped somehow to the West as well. So some counties in Washington and California, I don't know if that's um, a person who has accidentally introduced that or if that's some sort of migratory bat species that has brought it from the East uh, to the West. But you know, whatever the case, unfortunately, it's still, still continuing to spread. Um, the estimated loss of bats in uh, in total, and this is from, I think, 2011, they said it's 6 million bats. So, you know, it's, it's much more, it's probably closer to 10 million, uh, if not more than that, since the disease has continued to spread. Uh, here in Ohio, we have some hibernacula that have experienced 99% um, mortality. So we'll talk when we get to the species about some of the ones that are most affected. But um, unfortunately, we've had to list some, some bat species as endangered this year uh, because they're being heavily impacted by white nose syndrome. So there are people that are working on, um, I guess, a cure or a treatment for this, but it's really difficult because um, you can't go into a cave and spray a fungicide or uh, introduce a bacteria to eat the fungus because cave ecosystems are really delicate. So if you go in and start messing with them, you're just gonna mess up the whole ecosystem. Um, and so that doesn't work. It's difficult to, to treat the bats. You might be able to put something on them to get rid of the fungus and then they're just gonna fly away to a cave and pick up the fungus because it's still there. So just the logistics of trying to treat, um, especially natural areas um, for this fungus, it's, it's really difficult. So the big focus that um, 
that we are, I guess the agencies are focusing on is to try to stop the spread. Unfortunately, it's not going very well, but um, if we can keep it from getting into the states where it's it hasn't reached yet, or at least limit the spread within those states, um, that's beneficial. And then just focusing on the conservation of, of the bats that we have left and trying to make sure we're protecting their habitat and allowing them to be able to, to reproduce and their populations to stabilize. Uh, some ways that you guys can help with that is um, mainly to pr practice responsible recreation. Um, and that's something that you can share with with people in your programs as well. I know a lot of people love to go off trail, especially if there's a cave off trail and you know, not all, all of our caves are gated, but in general, you're usually supposed to stay out. There might be signs warning people to stay out because of white nose syndrome. But if you go into a cave, you're potentially picking up those spores. And again, although we assume white nose is everywhere, it might, it might not be. So you might pick them up on your shoe and then spread it to a different cave uh, or area where maybe there's bats that have taken refuge there because there is no white nose and now you've introduced it into that cave. Um, so responsible recreation is great. Uh, if you do any recreational caving or rock climbing, then we strongly encourage you to practice proper decontamination. So you can find um, on the white nose syndrome website, there's a list of, um, uh, I think it's different chemicals or like bleach solutions, what, what is effective for, for killing this fungus. So uh, you should always decontaminate your gear in between sites. So even if you're moving from Northeast Ohio to Southern Ohio uh, to do caving in different parts of the state, you should decontaminate your gear um, you know, between each site. And say you are in Ohio and you're caving and then you wanna go out to Ohio and do some, or go out to Idaho and do some caving, you should use all new gear. You should not take anything from a state where white nose has been found uh, to a state where it hasn't, just again, to reduce the risk of introducing those spores. Okay, so just to swing back and finish up the, uh, the annual cycle talk here, um, for the bats that make it through, uh, the winter, they're going to start emerging in the spring. So um, again, this is kind of just the reverse of the fall. So now I've got that the graph in the upper left where the, the hoary bats are coming back from the south, they're moving north again. There's a little bit of swarming for the bats that um, stayed around when they come out in the spring. This is going to be around end of March or early April. They might swarm around those caves a little bit, um, not necessarily for mating. Again, the mating takes place in the fall, but just for communication kind of staging before they move to their summer grounds. And I have this picture of mating here again, but again, it's not really actively mating, but they're going to release that sperm that they've stored. Uh, and then the females uh, eggs are going to be fertilized in preparation for the summer. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna give you guys some information about um, the species of bats that we have in Ohio. And I apologize, you're gonna hear me rustling some notes here. I wanna tell you, um, I think it's really interesting the scientific names and what they mean. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to see my notes on the screen, so I haven't printed out, so I'll just be rustling my papers a little bit while I, while I do that. But we have 10 species of bats that um, we consider commonly found in Ohio. So again, as I mentioned, you might see anywhere from 10 to 14 species, depending on what, um, what source you're looking at. And the most common one I see is 11. So there is an 11th bat. It's called the Raffinesque's big-eared bat. Um, it was found in Adams County in 1960-something. Uh, there may be two or three specimens that were found in a cave of uh, dead bats, and we have not found it here since. So I really don't consider that to be, um, you know, we're not really in the range or maybe at the very northern edge of the range where we could get um, a vagrant one flying through, but we haven't captured it since the 1960s. I really don't think that we have it here yet. <laughs> so I always take that one out. And so that's why I say that there's only 10 species of bats that are commonly found here. Uh, so you can divide these into two groups. The first group we're going to talk about are the migratory tree species. So these are the ones that are going to migrate during the winter. And first up, we have the hoary bat, Lazarus cinereus. So Lazarus means hairy tail. Um, if you'll notice this bat, uh, the other one on the screen too, the eastern red bat, they're both in the same genus. So both of these bats have a furry tail membrane. Uh, and that is because they both roost in the foliage of trees. So they're not going to get um, inside the bark as some other bats do, they're just gonna hang in the trees. And it gets kind of cold even in the summer for bats. So they can use that furred tail membrane to wrap it around themselves and keep them warm in the evening. So Lazarus means uh, hairy bat, or sorry, hairy tail. And then Cenarius means ash colored. Uh, and then hoary kind of means the same thing. And that refers to the, the fur of the bat. So the fur is dark and it's got tipped, uh, tipped with white. So it kind of gives them this frosted or this hoary appearance. Uh, this is the largest bat that we have in Ohio, and I believe also the largest in the United States. So the wingspan is about uh, 15. I've seen also up to 18 inches. These bats emerge late in the evening and they fly really high. So if you're out watching 
and you see bats that are flying over the treetops and it's still you know not quite dark yet maybe a little dusky and they're up really high it, and looks like a big bat it's most likely going to be a hoary bat these ones are really difficult to catch because they just fly uh, fly above the trees higher than our nets um, can capture and these are one, again one of the solitary roosters so they're going to roost in those leaves of trees and the next species is uh, eastern red bat Lazarus borealis so again hairy tail and then borealis just means northern uh, it's kind of a, a larger bat but a little bit smaller than the, the hoary bat, wingspan of 11 to 13 inches. This is an interest, interesting species because they're one of the few mammal species that exhibit sexual dimorphism. So the males and the females actually look a little bit different. Uh, the males, which is the one in the picture here, are really bright orange, red color, which is how they get their name. And the females are a little bit duller. Um, they're like a buffy chestnut, almost a yellow color. These bats emerge early in the evening. And again, because of their coloration, they're pretty easy to identify. So they might be one of the ones that you can identify as they're flying around. Um, and another solitary roosting species, so they'll roost again in, in clusters of leaves and shrubs, um, even herbaceous plants. Something interesting about them is, uh, although they are migratory species, they do hibernate, uh, and it's thought that they hibernate in leaf litter. So rather than being inside a cave, they're actually going to burrow down into the leaf litter, uh, which is really interesting. We've got two more migratory species, um, evening bat and Nyctisius humoralis. So let's grab my notes here. Uh, Nyctisius means belonging to the night. And then humoralis just means pertaining to the humerus. So I'm not really sure uh, how that applies to this bat, but <laughs> uh, that's the name of this one. Another medium-sized bat with a wingspan of 11 inches. They're, they're fairly nondescript. They look a lot like the big brown bat, which you'll see, I think, in the next slide. Um, so they're just dark brown on top and kind of a tan color underneath. Um, we are at the edge of the range of, uh, of the evening bat, but it is expanding. So you're more likely to encounter this bat if you're in Southern Ohio, but we do get it sometimes further North. And again, with um, climate change and, and the, sh the shift in our bat species composition, we might start seeing them move further North. Uh, these guys emerge early in the evening and they forage uh, over open fields as opposed to some of the more uh, wooded areas that some of the bats prefer. And something unique about them is they, they have a musty odor <laughs> when you capture them. It's difficult to describe. I saw it described as um, burnt orange, but I have smelled this bat. I don't really remember it smelling like burnt orange, but I can confirm that it just has a scent that other bats don't have. Uh, and then the last one, silver-haired bat, uh, Lazia nycteris noctivagans. So Lazia nycteris is another way of saying hairy bat. Uh, and then Noctivagans means night wanderer. So this is my personal favorite scientific name. It means a hairy night wanderer, essentially. Um, again, another mid-sized bat, 11 inch wingspan. These ones are very distinct. Uh, if you see them, they have chocolate brown or dark black fur, and then they've got this white tips, uh, which is how it got the name silver-haired bat. And we don't think that this is a permanent resident here in Ohio. We basically think that it kind of just migra migrates through during the summer or during the spring and the fall. So essentially, their summer grounds are gonna be further north of us in Canada and then their winter grounds are further south of us. Um, but we have found a couple during our hibernacular surveys. So um, that's not to say that all of them, you know, move out or that they're never here, but the majority of them um, are not gonna be permanent residents. Uh, this bat is a slow flyer and it leaves the roost pretty early. So if you see a really dark bat that's flying around, um, maybe not as agile, not as quickly as some of the other species, it could be a silver-haired bat. And again, if, if you can see it, it's pretty distinct. Okay, so we've got six more to go, and those are going to be our cave bats. So true cave bats are actually ones that hybrid, or that use caves during the summer and the winter. Um, there's one called the gray bat that does that. We don't actually have any of those here, so we just refer to our cave bats as the ones that hibernate in the caves uh, here in Ohio during the winter. So first we have these small-footed bats. Um, it's in the genus Myotis, which a couple of these bats are going to be in the genus Myotis, and that means mouse-eared. Uh, and then Midas Libii. Libii just refers to the, um, the scientist who first uh, discovered the species. So this one and the other one on the slide here, the tricolored bat, are our smallest bats in Ohio. Um, depending on the individual, they can kind of overlap. So I don't really know which one is confirmed to be the smallest, but both of these are pretty small. They've got wingspans of only eight to nine inches. Uh, the small-footed bat is pretty easy to identify. It's got essentially what we call a black face mask. So um, you notice from that photo, its eyes and the nose are, are just bare skin, it's black, uh, and then the ears are also black, so it kind of makes it look like it's wearing a mask. Uh, this bat, it's interesting, it's, it's rare in Ohio and it's rare in all of the eastern United States, but I was reading a book about this over the weekend, it was saying it's where you find it, it's common, but it's rare to find it, if that makes sense. <laughs> so if you happen to find a spot um, where you find a small-footed bat, you might find a whole bunch of them, but it's really rare that you would find it. 
Uh, and this one is active well after dark. So um, you're probably not gonna encounter this one if you're just kind of bat watching outside. Next up, we've got the tricolored bat, Perimiotis subflavis. Um, Perimiotis means uh, close to myotis, so it's a very similar genus. Then subflavis means under yellow, so that refers to the uh, underside of the bat. You can see from that photo there is a little bit yellow. Uh, the wingspan's eight to 10 inches. The, the common name tricolored bat refers to each individual hair on that bat. So they don't have three colors um, on their body necessarily, but if you were to pluck one hair, uh, the bottom is dark, the middle has a light band, and then the top is gonna be that red brown color that you see in the photo. So they've got tricolored banded hair. Another easy way to identify them is they've got this really pink form and a really black wing. So the contrast between the form and the wing is easy to identify when you see them. Uh, these guys are also active before dusk and they fly really erratically. And because of their small size, a lot of people sometimes think that they're a moth flying around. So this is another one that you, you might see um, and another one that roosts in the clusters of leaves in the tree. Um, you might notice that I have this, this one colored in red. So unfortunately, this is one of our newly listed state endangered species. So we just listed this one in, in July. It is one that is uh, heavily affected by, by white nose syndrome and um, is also under consideration by Fish and Wildlife to be federally listed as well. So potentially in the next three to five years, uh, however long it takes them to, to make that decision, it might also be a federally listed species as well. Uh, next two here, I've got the little brown bat and the big brown bat, which are the ones that you might be familiar with. Um, little brown bat, again, we've got this one here in red, another one of our newly listed um, in state endangered species and also under consideration for listing by, uh, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife as, as federally endangered. And again, um, due to white nose syndrome, this species has been absolutely decimated, decimated by white nose syndrome. And I'll show you some data a little bit later uh, to show that. So uh, the scientific name, Myotis lucifugus. So Myotis again means mouse-eared and lucifugus means light fleer. So just referring to the um, nocturnal nature of the bat. So another one of the mid-sized bats, eight to 10 inch or eight to 11 inch wingspan. Again, fairly nondescript. It's, it's this brownish color with a tan uh, underside, similar to the evening bat and pretty similar to the big brown bat next to it. Uh, as I mentioned previously, the most common myotis in Ohio and one of the most common bats, um, but we hardly see it at all anymore. Um, it's active at dusk and these are uh, one of the species that are highly colonial. So the females will form really large maternity colonies uh, in the winter. And next up, the big brown bat, Abtesicus fuscus. So uh, Abtesicus is a sort of a slang uh, Latin word for able to fly. And then fuscus just means brown. Uh, so it looks very similar to the, the little brown bat. It's just uh, obviously a little bit bigger. The wingspan is uh, 12 to 13 inches. And the same coloration, it's got that brown on the, on the back and a little bit tan underneath. Uh, you can sort of tell when you're looking at these in person, but the, the big brown bat fur is a little bit longer. It's a little bit shinier. Uh, this is the most common species now that we have in Ohio, and they're active at sunset. Um, and again, another highly colonial species. And both of these bats are the ones that are most likely to use um, anthropogenic or human roost. So this is the one you're most likely, or, or these two, I guess, are the ones you'll most likely find in your house, in your barn. If you put up a bat house, these are the ones that are most likely going to colonize those bat houses. Um, I would say almost certainly that it's going to be big browns just because we don't really have a lot of little browns anymore, but little browns do, um, you know, in the past have used those. So you might get lucky, but, but these are the two that you're most likely to, uh, to come into contact with or to encounter, I would say. Sarah, we got a quick question about if they are found in your house and a company removes them, are they have the sort of background to know what to let them go or what happens? Just kind of a question about that. Yeah, so the only legal way to get bats out of your house is to do what's called a bat exclusion. Uh, you can hire a company to do this, or you can try to do it yourself. But basically what they'll come in and do is they will um, seal off all the entrances except one where the bats are getting in, and they install essentially what's a one-way door. So it lets the bats get out, and then when they come back in the evening, they can't get back in. So they'll leave that for a couple days until they think all the bats uh, have left or until they have certified that all the bats have left. And then they'll take that device off and just seal up the hole. So uh, they're not going in and you know taking them out by hand and, and uh, releasing them back outside because they just come right back in your house. So that's the only legal way of doing it. We do have restrictions um, on when you can do that. There's a period in the summer where you're not allowed to do that restriction unless you get special permission from the Division of Wildlife and that's to protect the babies. So if you've got a maternity colony in your house and you do that bat exclusion, uh, you're excluding the adults, but those babies can't fly. 
So you're going to end up with a bunch of babies in your house that you are essentially killing um, because you're separating them from their mothers. So unless there's a real um, health risk, human health risk associated with that situation, we just ask that you wait until August and then do the bat exclusion. Um, yeah, and our last, so our last two bats here, we've got Indiana bat, Myotis sodalis, uh, and the northern long-eared bat, Myotis septentrionalis. So unfortunately, again, you'll notice these are both in red. Uh, the Indiana bat is actually federally endangered as well as state endangered, and it's been federally endangered since the 1960s. So the problem with this bat um, is that it really likes old growth forest, which we really just don't have a lot of anymore. So that's more of a habitat loss problem, although uh, unfortunately it is also susceptible to white-nose syndrome. So it's kind of getting a, a one-two punch uh, right now. And then the northern long-eared bat uh, is federally threatened, but state endangered. Um, and it is under consideration by the Fish and Wildlife to be upgraded to federally endangered as well. Uh, and that again is due just primarily to, to white-nose syndrome. Um, so we got Myotis sodalis, uh, Myotis again, mouse-eared, and sodalis means companion. And that refers to the fact that these bats will hibernate uh, in the winter in really, really tight clusters. If you've ever seen um, a pictures of inside a cave and there's just these huge clusters of these little gray bats um, packed tightly together, that's most likely an Indiana bat. They'll live in colonies of um, hundreds of thousands, of, you know, when they were that numerous, but now thousands of, of bats uh, in just a few hibernacula. Another medium-sized bat, nine to 11 inch wingspan, um, these are a little bit subjective. So Indiana bats look very, very similar to little brown bats, even when you're holding them next to each other. They, but people will say that Indiana bats are a little bit more gray. They've got a little pinker nose. Um, again, that can be really subjective and can vary between individuals. Um, the biggest thing is they've got this thing called a cow car. All bats have this. It's a cartilaginous uh, area near their foot. And Indiana bats have a keel on it, which basically just means they have like a little bump of skin uh, that comes off of that cow car very difficult to see. Uh, and then the other difference between them and the little brown bat has to deal with their toe hairs. And I forget which one it is, but one of them has toe hairs that extend past the toes and one of them doesn't. <laughs> so it's really difficult when you get these two bats. It's, you know, if you just have them hanging somewhere and you're not, you don't have them in your hand, it's really difficult to tell them apart. You really have to have them up close. Uh, and these are the ones that will roost in dead trees or under exfoliating bark. Um, so exfoliating bark just means things like shag bark hickory, where even the live trees have um, peeling bark, or it could be um, any species really if something has happened to it and they've got kind of like big pieces of bark that are loose that, that bats can get behind. Um, they really like those kind of areas. And then we have Midas septentrionalis and septentrionalis just means um, northern or boreal again. Um, another mid-sized bat, nine to 10 inch wingspan. These ones are really easy to identify because they have these really super cute long ears. So if you're holding the bat and you push its ear forward, it's actually gonna extend past the tip of its nose. And then they have a really long pointed tragus. So all bats have a tragus. We have a tragus. It's this little um, sort of cartilaginous bump that sort of extends into our ear. Um, and theirs is really long and pointed as opposed to short and blunt in most of the other species. Uh, this is a colonial species that um, the females will form colonies, but they're a lot smaller. So compared to little browns and big browns, which can be hundreds, if not thousands of bats, um, the northern long eared bat is generally smaller colonies, like 60 or so. Uh, and these ones are interesting because they're more active in wooded areas. So they're one of the few bats that actually likes to, to forage and hang out um, in more dense uh, environments rather than foraging over open agricultural fields or, or corridors. So actually be um, in the forest foraging among the trees. Sarah, we had one last question yep. before you leave this species. Sure. Um, I, someone thought that the big brown was susceptible to white nose syndrome and if if it is, why isn't it also being sort of on the conservation list? Yeah, so they are susceptible, um, but it just seems like they don't, their mortality is not as significant. And I think it's because they're a larger bat. So, um, and there have been some studies showing essentially that fatter bats are the ones that are um, surviving white nose of any species, but um, those myota species are very small. They're among the smallest of our bats. And then you've got this big, um, you know, chunky big brown bat that, that has a lot of weight. So I just think that they're better able um, to survive uh, the, the infection during the winter because they just have stored up that much more fat. So they are susceptible. We do see losses from them, but they haven't been decimated like some of those smaller species have been. Okay, so kind of that's leaving, I guess, the background section, um, the, the sort of facts that I want you guys to know and to be able to pass on to people. I mean, I guess this is all stuff that I want you to know, but um, that's kind of the overview of bats. And so now I'm gonna move into 
um, how we at the division study bats or how all um, bat researchers study bats essentially. Um, but before I talk about you know the how, we kind of want to know the why. So why are we why are we doing this? Um, first is simply population monitoring. Uh, of course, this is really important post white nose. So we want to know um, are our population stabilizing? Are we still um, seeing losses of bats? Um, are we potentially seeing increases? Um, we've also learned post white nose that it's really important to do this even for the species that we think are common. So like big brown bats um, or tricolored bats um, were, were fairly common, northern long-eared bats, and we didn't do a lot of research on them when they were really common because people weren't that interested in them. And now they're disappearing and it's, it's um, you know, we don't quite know for tricolored bats, we don't really know what what roosts they're using. So we can't even really try to conserve those areas. So it's really important when you have the opportunity to, to do the research on everything that you can, um, you know, you don't wanna wait until it's too late. So we do a lot of population monitoring for all of our bats just to, um, to be able to hopefully detect when there's an issue before um, there are any more issues. So we're obviously looking for those endangered and threatened species. Uh, that's so we can protect the areas while they're there um, and also try to protect areas that are similar. So we mentioned old growth forest for Indiana bats. Well, we wanna to try to protect all those areas. We wanna figure out again, where are those tricolored bats? What types of trees are they using? What types of environments are they roosting in? Um, and how can we protect those areas? Uh, and so it kind of leads to the next point, protection of, of the roosts during the summer and then also the hibernacula. So where are they going in the winter? How can we make sure those, those hibernacula are, are um, protected and preserved? Um, bats are very vulnerable when they're in their roosts and their hibernacula, especially the ones that are colonial. Um, for example, Indiana bats, again, they can uh, we had a, a, a roost here in Preble County, thousands of bats. If something were to happen to that, you would lose thousands of endangered bats just by losing one hibernacula. So trying to figure out where those places are and protect them uh, is, is one of the reasons that we are studying bats. So getting into the methods here, um, the first way that we can capture bats is by mist netting. You guys might be familiar with this. Um, it's the same method that they use for birds. So a mist net is essentially a nylon, a really thin nylon net. You can see a photo in the upper left. That's a pretty good photo of, of a net set up, um, but not exactly where you would really want to put a net. <laughs> so a bat would really easily be able to fly over or around this net, but it's just good, a good representation of what a mist net looks like. Uh, the photo on the right hand side is, is a lot better a represent, representation of how you want to set up a mist net for a bat. So you want to find some sort of travel corridor um, Bats, like people and like a lot of other animals, they're, you know, they're lazy. They want to use corridors that are really easy for them to fly down. And places like rivers or trails or uh, roads are really easy for them because there's no clutter uh, in that main corridor there. But you want to find something that kind of has trees around the edge of it or some way that you can potentially block off that entire corridor. So this is a really nice example. They're putting that net, they're going to raise that net up, and there really is no choice for the bat but to run straight into that. It can't go above it. It can't really easily go to the side. So that's a good example of a mist net setup. Uh, when the bat runs into it, it's gonna get tangled, like the photo in the bottom there. Uh, and then we'll come by every 15 minutes or so to, to check the nets and then you can remove that bat from the net. The benefit to mist netting is that you have that bat in your hands. So you can collect a lot of information on it. You can get uh, positively identify the species. You can do a weight, you can check the sex, you can check reproductive status. Um, if you wanna take any samples, if you wanna do like, uh, we'll sometimes do wing punch to do DNA analysis or to do other sorts of analyses. Um, you can do a swab if you wanna swab for um, uh, any sorts of diseases or things like that. So having the bat in your hand is really beneficial, um, but mist netting is, it's pretty time consuming. You have to have um, a lot of people there to help. Sometimes you have to have people that are able to handle bats so they have to be rabies vaccinated. Um, so it's great in that you can get a lot of information from them, but it's a little bit time consuming as well. Um, okay, so don't get super overwhelmed and trying to dig into the, this slide. Basically, what I'm sharing here is data from our MISNET surveys from 26, or 2006 to 2017. Um, it's important to note for MISNET surveys and for, for this, the way we've analyzed this data, um, we can do MISNET surveys as the agency to do, again, just population studies, but a lot of MISNET surveys are done by consulting companies uh, for the purpose of construction projects. So if you're doing construction and you wanna cut trees during the summer, you need to do a bat survey ahead of time to look for any of those threatened and endangered species to see if um, you're allowed to cut trees during the summer or if you have to wait until um, October. So the way this data is, is collected, it's not really I don't want to say it's biased exactly, but we didn't go through and set this up in like a scientifically rigorous way. So um, kind of just an asterisk by the, the conclusions, I guess. So the things that I want you to notice is we look in the upper left, 
in 2006, um, that that really large portion that's kind of the teal color it says 74%, that is represented, representing little brown bat captures in 2006. And then the 6% there, the blue color, that is northern long-eared bats. 15%, the red color is um, big brown bats. And then the 4%, the orange are eastern red bats. And so as you work your way, you know, we're not going to go through all these in detail, but as you work your way to the right, I just want you to notice how um, those change, especially when you get to 2011. So from 2006 to 2010, there's a good amount of little browns in uh, northern long-eared bats generally making up about half of all of our captures. Um, and there's always going to be a good amount of big browns and eastern red bats as well. But then when you hit 2011, 2012, again, that's when white nose was first discovered. And then notice those colors change as you go uh, through. And you'll notice that there's hardly any, by the time you get 2017, it's maybe 1% of captures are little browns and 1% northern long ears, maybe even less than, you can barely see that northern long eared sliver there. Uh, and then just tons and tons of big browns and eastern red bats. So um, again, the sort of Conclusion with an asterisk here is that the species composition of our bats is, is changing post white nose. So we are getting a lot more big brown bats and a lot more Eastern red bats in those smaller species, those myota species are, are going away because they're the hardest hit by white nose. Um, so talking again about how we study bats, um, we can do radio tracking. So that's another benefit of mist netting. You have that bat in your hand so you can attach a radio transmitter to them. Um, the radio transmitters are small. They're, they have to be 5% um, or less of the bat's body weight. So they're these really small transmitters. Uh, and we're gonna put these on any female from any of those state or federally endangered species. So tricolored bat, northern long-eared bat, um, Indiana bat, and little brown bat. Specifically the females because we're most interested in finding those maternity colonies because again, we want to make sure that we protect those. We want to protect all the females and all their babies. Um, the males are solitary roosters, so you could track them. You could track any of the other species. I mean, you can do this for any of the bats, but those are the ones that are most interested, the females of those endangered species. So essentially you shave a little bit of hair off the back of the bat, use a non-toxic, non-permanent glue, and glue this transmitter and this big antenna to the back of the bat. And then using a receiver, and a Yagi antenna, you can actually um, track that bat back to its roost. Um, the transmitter is gonna last for anywhere from three to 10 days normally. Um, either it'll just fall off, or again, if this bat is in a, a, in a colony, sometimes the bats will groom each other. And so they might get this transmitter groomed off of them, but hopefully um, you're able to find the roost in time before the transmitter falls off. And then we um, can do what is called uh, emergence counts or roost monitoring. I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later because this is one of our community science projects. But essentially uh, you find the roost and what you do is you just kind of post up outside of it at dusk and you count the number of bats that come out. And you might wanna do this several times throughout the year uh, or throughout the summer, I guess, to try to get an idea of that colony size. So you do a count um, when you find it, if it's still early summer and you think there might be babies in there that are not flying yet, you'd wanna do another count later in, that, in the summer um, so say you counted 10 the first time and then you counted 20 the next time, you might be able to assume that there's 10 pups that have been born to that colony. So it's just a way that we can keep track of, of colony locations and colony sizes, as well as um, populations, whether they're increasing or decreasing. Um, so those are mostly all associated with mist netting. The other uh, big way that we study bats is through acoustic monitoring. So acoustic monitoring is basically recording those echolocation calls of bats that we talked about earlier. Uh, this setup here, there's a couple different types of acoustic monitors. monitors. This one is um, from Wildlife Acoustics. So essentially it looks like a little bit like a game camera or trail camera. Um, and then you attach uh, that to a microphone that you put on a pole and set that out wherever you want to monitor. And this is called passive monitoring. So you can essentially leave that for as long as you want. Um, you can just come back and change the batteries, swap out the memory cards, and you can just leave that there forever monitoring the bat population. And we'll talk about how this works a little bit more um, in a minute. Sarah, is, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. No, we had a one quick question submitted oh. earlier on acoustics. Um, yeah. uh, specifically, somebody asked about a song meter, the SM4 bat, mm -hmm. a way to help get that analyzed in an affordable fashion. Someone had done some monitoring. Um, I did see that question, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is a song meter in this picture here, just uh, to say that. <laughs> in a, Affordable fashion. So I believe this person, I, I, I think I might know who they are because it, they said that they help us with acoustic monitoring, um, probably the mobile surveys that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, I have the software. 
if it's somebody that helps us out and does monitoring for us, it does not take much effort for me to process that through our software. Um, the software programs, if you want to buy them yourself, um, are very expensive. So th there's one called Kaleidoscope from Wildlife Acoustics. It's $400, I think, for a year license. There's another one called BCID or Backhaul Identification. That one is um, $1,500. So as far as getting them on your own, again, if it's somebody that helps out us, I'm more than happy to analyze the data for you. I, I'm not going to sit down and manually vet it, um, but I will run it through our auto ID programs and send that back to you with no problem. Um, the other option is to try to talk to a consultant and have them do the same thing. But again, no idea how much they're going to charge for that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, unfortunately, there, there is a free program called Analook. You can download that for free and you can look at your back calls. Unfortunately, it doesn't have the auto identification capabilities that the other software does. So um, that's a free way you can look at the calls. And if you want to try to teach yourself how to identify them and um, for the people that have no idea what I'm talking about, I'm going to talk about this in just a minute. <laughs> um, but to whoever asked that question, again, if, if you want to contact me, I can probably analyze that data for you, send you the auto results, um, so you don't have to pay for one of those really expensive programs. Um, okay, so passive monitoring. So moving into active monitoring, um, this device is called an Anabat. Um, so on the right-hand side, the thing that the person's holding, that yellow and cream colored thing is the Anabat. Uh, attached to the top of it is a PDA, so that actually allows you to see the bat calls as they're coming in. And then that black thing on the front is the microphone. So the microphone's here and then the other microphones as well. They only re record ultrasonic noise, so they're not going to record you standing in front of it talking. <laughs> People are always worried when we set up acoustic devices that um, you know, they're going to record our conversations, but they're only picking up the ultrasonic noise. So you can do active monitoring with this device. That's basically you can walk around a trail, you can walk you know, out in your backyard and holding this device. Um, and pick up, um, pick up the bat sounds. The way that we use it is we take that microphone off the front and we put it in a specialized car mount, which is the photo that you see on the left. So we have volunteers all across the state. And again, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but this is the other community science project that we have that you might be able to be involved in. Um, but we have routes that have been going all across the state for the last 10 years. And they put these microphones on their car and they'll drive around and record um, the bat activity. So we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about echolocation and sort of what we're getting from these acoustics. So we record these calls and then what do we do with them? We, so we come back and we can bring them to these specialized software programs that I was talking about, Kaleidoscope, BCID, Analook. Uh, we're going to put them in there and they're going to come out something like this. So I believe this is a silver haired bat call. Um, and looking at, I have another slide in just a minute where we can compare some bat calls, but essentially you look at the frequency, you look at the shape of this call. Um, and you can start to identify the species. And then I have a sound here that hopefully it played earlier, so I hope it plays for you guys now. This is what, again, the bat calls are ultrasonic. We cannot hear them, but if we could hear them, um, this is what we would be hearing all the time. Um, so that's just a portion of a bat call there. You can hear a little bit where it kind of speeds up a little bit, um, and that's called a terminal buzz or a feeding buzz. So it doesn't necessarily always mean that the bat is feeding, but um, for example, a little brown bat is generally going to be emitting 20 pulses a second as it's flying around, just navigating, searching for something. Um, as it approaches an insect or maybe approaches an obstacle, it can emit 50 pulses a second. So it's gonna speed up and you can kind of see that in the end of the call here um, where those pulses are getting really, really close together and really steep. So they can, um, alter the, the frequency, the pitch, they can alter the speed of their pulses in order to help them get more information about their environment. Oops, there we go again. <laughs> okay, so I'm talking about being able to identify species based on the acoustics, so how do we do that? So I've got three showing here for you. Um, on the y-axis of these graphs, or it might be a little bit hard to see, but on this one, uh, the hoary bat on the left, you can see pretty well, that is gonna be kilo, or the frequency in kilohertz. So the first thing that you wanna do is start looking at that minimum frequency uh, for these bat calls. So that little swoop that is a pulse, want to look at the minimum frequency of that of that call. So for the hoary bat, uh, in this call particularly, it's somewhere between 18 to 22, 24. Uh, and then compare that to the tricolored bat, the one in the middle here, the minimum frequency for that is 45. So right away, you can tell that these are two different bats. We divide them into two um, so it's low, medium, and high frequency, essentially, and we know which bats are in those different groups. So even if you couldn't identify the species, you would know, well, this first one is a low, uh, a low frequency bat, so it's got to be one of three species. And then this other one is a high frequency bat, so it's got to be one of you know, four species or something. So even if you can't 
identify it exactly, you can get a little bit more information by just looking at the frequency. Uh, and then the other way you can uh, help identify is looking at the shape of these pulses. So if you look at the tricolor bat call and the little brown bat call, the frequency is pretty similar, 40 to 45. So right away, you might not be able to, uh, to tell those two apart. But then you can look at the shape of the call. So tricolored bat call is one of the easiest to identify. It's got this really distinct hockey stick shape, um, a pretty consistent frequency all the way across. So it's not going to be going up and down a lot like the hoary bat does. And then you look at the little brown bat and, and those calls are a lot steeper. They don't have quite the same bend that the tricolored bat does. So uh, using those two characteristics, the combination of the frequency, the shape of the pulse, there's some other things too. Um, that's how we start to identify uh, what bat species we have. So luckily there are now auto ID programs that will do this for you, but they're not perfect. So you can run them through these programs. It'll give you its best guess, but um, for the species that we're most concerned about, our threatened and endangered species, it's always a good idea to go back in and kind of manually confirm. Again, um, those programs are built from algorithms. They're built from, from really nice, perfect calls. And unfortunately, when you're recording in the real world, you don't always get perfect calls. So you'll get calls where there's three or four bats that are calling at the same time, and it just looks like a jumbled mess. And it might identify one of those bats, but there might be three more in there um, that it didn't identify. So you kind of want to look at all your data by hand too. And that's the part that takes the most time. Um, so this is a graph from that, uh, that community science program that we have uh, that I mentioned. And I'll talk a little bit more. I got another slide later when I get to the community science section. <laughs> but essentially, we have routes all across the state that we started in 2011 and we've been doing them for 10 years. I don't have the data from 2020 yet. I haven't been able to start analyzing that yet. Um, but one of the drawbacks of acoustics is that you can't tell individual bats. So other than telling the species, but you could have 10 calls from tricolored bats and you don't know if that's one tricolored bat that is just circling your microphone and called 10 times or if it's 10 different tricolored bats that flew by once. So you can't get uh, a concrete number of how many bats. You can only get basically a relative abundance or we do average detection rate um, with this mobile survey. So again, we started in 2011, 2012, right when uh, white nose was discovered, got this interesting, so this graph is the average detection rate. Um, so bats per minute per mile. Uh, in 2011, we or 2012, we had a weird bump. For some reason, we detected a lot of big brown bats that year. Um, but then after that, you can see the, the impacts of white nose syndrome. So very um, steep decline in the uh, average detection rate for our bats. Uh, things started to look good around 2015. We were going back up, but for the last two years, we've been on a, a decline again. So I'm not quite sure uh, what caused that increase or what caused the decrease. Um, but again, we have another year of this, and then we are. Sarah, it looks like you might have froze up a little bit. So sorry about that, folks. Hopefully we'll get Sarah back here in just a second. are hardy enough to survive um, more exposed like that, but they will use things like that um, to hibernate. And hopefully you guys can still hear me because I'm getting a thing saying my internet connection is unstable. <laughs> um, we missed you for like about a minute, right? Oh at, no. A minute before the transition, uh, okay. right at the end. Yeah, oh, uh, we saw so, the graph, uh, got all that, but then right before you switched, we, we got cut off. Okay. Um, Let's see, I'm not sure what exactly I said there, <laughs> but basically that um, probably that we're continuing. Um, so we've been doing the survey for 10 years. We are continuing to do it in the next uh, next summer and on, but we're changing our protocol a little bit. So that's one of the community science projects I'll talk about in a little bit and how you guys can get involved because we're basically wiping the slate clean and starting over with this. So there's gonna be a lot of opportunities for people uh, to get involved in that. So hopefully you didn't miss anything else important, but <laughs> happy to answer any questions if something didn't make sense. Okay, so moving into the high vernacular surveys. Uh, so, you know, of course we're interested in what bats are doing in the summer, but we also wanna know what they're doing in, in the winter as well. Um, bats exhibit high sight fidelity, both in the summer and the winter. So that means they're basically gonna go back to the same place every year. Um, so same high vernacular, the same summer roost, they're gonna use those year after year, which makes it easy for us to try to monitor those and, and keep tabs on them. So. We are right now involved in a project with Dr. Joseph Johnson from Ohio University. So for the past two years, we've been doing hibernacular surveys. We'll continue for this year as well, uh, the third and uh, maybe final year. But basically, we've got a bunch of known hibernaculas. We're going back to those every year, counting the number of bats that are there. And then at the end, you know, we'll be able to do a lot of comparisons. So uh, 
and as I was mentioning, I'm not sure you guys heard this part, but they, but um, the hibernacular can vary widely. You know, we've got these smaller caves in the upper left. That's probably what traditionally you would think of as a cave. Um, we've got larger areas on the upper right. That's 21 Horse Cave in Hawking County. Um, we get some bats in there occasionally. Um, this one in the lower left, this is not me. Uh, I definitely would never go in, into this little hole here. Uh, this is one called Fern Cave. Um, a lot of these bats or these caves have uh, endemic isopods in them too. So this is one in Adams County that has an endemic isopod. And uh, interestingly enough, we did find a bat in there last year. So they'll use stuff like that. And then that lower right is the, the honeycomb sandstone that I was talking about. Um, we get mostly big browns that will hibernate and things like that because again, they're the bigger, hardier species. They can handle those cold temperatures. Um, and that's something interesting that we found during this. And I, I don't know if this is something new that bats are trying to do to avoid white nose. They're coming into, um, into these above ground areas because although the white nose fungus does like cold, it doesn't like it extremely cold. So it's possible that they are moving um, out of the caves that are a little bit warmer and moving to these above ground areas that are colder uh, as a way to survive white nose. But we don't really know because again, people, these bats were so common, people weren't really studying this before. So we don't know if this is something new or if they were always doing this and we just never noticed. Uh, and just to share a little bit of data from what we've collected in the last two years, we have found um, five species of bats during our surveys. I just want to point out, again, we, we found a couple silver-haired bats, which is interesting because those are thought to be migratory non-resident species, but we have found a couple um, hanging out. It's possible that for us or for them, Ohio is warmer in the winter than uh, where they would spend the summer in Canada, but again, we're not finding huge numbers. And then we found one eastern small-footed myotis, which is really cool. Um, I think it may be only the fourth one that's ever been found in the state. So we found it here uh, hibernating, I believe, in Hawking County. Um, but uh, far and away, the, the most uh, numerous bat that we're finding, a lot of big brown bats. Um, we have found what we think is one of the last um, uh, large hibernacula for little brown bats. So luckily that is an area that is protected. So hopefully we can keep that protected um, and keep, uh, keep protecting those bats in that area. Uh, and so I just want to finish up this part by just talking a little bit about conservation of bats and some of the threats. So of course, I already mentioned white nose syndrome. That's a big one. Um, but there are threats um, and, and bats are unfortunately threatened all over the world. It's not just here in the States, but um, some of the, the things that they're, they're dealing with here is wind energy development and operations. So um, our cave bats are the ones that are most affected by white nose syndrome because again, they're, they're living in those caves where the fungus grows um, and the migratory bats don't really get hit by white nose, but unfortunately the migratory species are the ones that are most impacted by wind energy because they're migrating through those corridors where um, a lot of wind uh, development is taking place. So particularly the eastern red bats and the hoary bats are um, really experiencing um, fairly high mortality from, from wind energy. So it's kind of like regardless of what type of strategy you use, there's something uh, that, that's hitting our bat population. Uh, there's pollution and contamination issues. So um, if bats are or when bats are eating uh, you know, insects, it might not seem like they're, they're eating a lot, but um, I mean, I guess they are eating a lot, but basically that's gonna magnify and go through this bioaccumulation process. So if they're eating thousands of insects every night, maybe one night's not a big deal, but they have to do that every night, especially the, the pregnant and the lactating females are eating just um, insane amounts of insects. And if those insects have been treated with pesticides or come into contact with different herbicides, that can then, uh, the toxins can build up in the bats over time and, and become uh, at a level that is lethal for them. And then a big one that's hitting um, you know, not just bats, but every animal, habitat loss and fragmentation. And this is particularly difficult for our bat species because they use so many different habitats. So not only just between species. So again, the Indiana bats like the old growth forest, but some of the other species um, maybe prefer like oak hickory mixed forest. And so within just the bat community here in Ohio, there's a lot of different um, types of areas that they use they've got those areas where they roost and then they've got foraging areas. So a lot of bats will forage over wetlands. And um, as I'm sure you guys know, our wetlands have been absolutely decimated in the last, um, you know, and then in the near past. So we've lost 90% of our wetlands. So their roosting habitat's going away, their foraging habitat is going away. They use the summer habitats and they use the winter habitat. So not only is the summer habitat vulnerable, but um, the winter hibernaculas are vulnerable, vulnerable as well. So unfortunately, because they use so many different habitats, there's just so many um, so much room for their habitats to be um, lost and to be fragmented. So that is a big, uh, big issue. And, and again, the Indiana bat was listed in 1960, primarily due to habitat loss. So it's not really getting any better. 
um, it's just another issue that they have to face. Uh, and in terms of, of why we care, uh, so this slide is a little bit about bats all over again because they're not just threatened here, they they're, have a lot of problems all over the world. But uh, in other areas of the world, bats are really important pollinators. So things like agave, agave is exclusively pollinated by bats. So you lose bats, you lose agave. Uh, there are other species uh, like some wild bananas, guava, and mango that are also bat pollinated as well. So we could potentially lose a lot of those food crops. Um, those bats that eat fruit are really good at dispersing seeds. So things like mangoes, dates, avocados that they're eating, uh, they're going to help with seed dispersal, help with reforestation, essentially, in some of those areas. Uh, and then, of course, in Ohio, we really like them because of uh, they eat insects. So bats are actually the top predator of night flying insects. And here in Ohio, and I guess most of the United States, a lot of bats are eating things like moths and beetles. And those things like moths and beetles are really um, big crop pests. So farmers really like bats or they should like bats because they save them a lot of money. Uh, there was a study that was done that estimated that bats save the agricultural industry $3.7 billion every year. Uh, and that's both in pesticides that they don't have to use because the bats are eating those, um, those insects and also crops that are not lost because again, the bats have eaten those insects. So here in Ohio, we should really want to um, support healthy bat populations because we have a lot of agriculture here and um, they're really helpful at eliminating those agricultural pests. Okay, so to finish up, I'm gonna talk a little more in detail about those two community science projects that I've referenced a bunch here. <laughs> So the first is the roost monitoring project. Um, essentially, the point of this is to identify the locations of the bat maternity colonies and then track the differences in the colony size, um, both throughout the summer and then if you do it every year, we can track your colony yearly. So this is a really simple project. It's really easy. Um, it's great for families. It's great you know, individuals. It doesn't take a lot of time. I would say it's about four to five hours of a commitment um, each summer. So essentially, um, you are going to find a bat roof. So if you have a bat house, if you've got bats in your barn, if you have a park nearby that has a bat house, you would go to that roost. Um, you're gonna do it twice during the summer. So once in uh, late spring, early summer, before those pups are born or before they're flying. And then you're gonna go again later in the summer um, after that period where the, the pups are gonna be volant. So going twice helps us, again, get an estimate of were there any pups born during that time? Did um, anybody else move in? Is the colony growing throughout the summer? Uh, and essentially what you do is you go to that, uh, that bat house or that roost. It can be a natural roost if you know where one is, it doesn't matter, but you go there about half an hour before sunset. You position yourself in a way that um, any bats that leave that roost are going to be silhouetted. So uh, in this photo that I have here, this is not from Ohio, but um, you wouldn't want to stand in such a way that any bats flying out would be um, kind of lost in those trees. So you might want to face the other way. So when the bats are flying out, you can see them silhouetted against the sky. Uh, and all you do is count them. So you stay there until either it's been 10 minutes since any bats have come out or until it's too dark for you to see. So again, half hour before sunset until maybe half hour after sunset. Um, or And that's twice a year or twice during the summer. So, you know, four to, four to five hours. Um, and you can send that data to me and then we will use it to, um, to help uh, understand where bats are living and, and how their populations are changing. So if you don't necessarily want to participate in this project, but you know where there are bat roosts, it's also helpful to me if you let me know. So if you've got parks near your house and uh, you don't want to monitor them, but somebody else might want to, just send me an email. I'll have my contact information at the end here. What I would really like to do is come up with a, a database of where all these, these roosts are or potential roosts are. That way, if I get contacted by somebody who says, hey, I'm in Franklin County and I want to do a monitoring project, but I don't know where any of the roosts are, I'll have a database and I can um, send them on their way. So I will have some information uh, again in one of the further slides of where you can find and download the protocol and the data sheets for this uh, community science project. So that's one of our big ones. Uh, I would really love for a lot of people to participate in this and I would love for people to participate across multiple years. <laughs> so that tends to be where we are falling off and we're a little bit limited. I don't have any data to share um, really from what we found so far because I get people that will participate one year and then they won't do it again. And you know, it's, it's nice to have, I guess, that one year snapshot, but what we really wanna see is, is that colony continuing to grow? Are they coming back every year? Is it getting bigger or do they disappear? Um, and so when people only participate for one year, it makes it difficult to do much analysis. So that is my plea for you to, to please help us with this project and uh, to please stick around and keep helping us with this project. And then the other one that I alluded to earlier was that mobile acoustic survey, um, which we are now going to be calling like NA bat monitoring. So 
if you look at this map, those red lines there are our current mobile survey routes, the one that we established um, from 2011 up to uh, this year. So these are the ones we've been currently running. You can see they're all across the state. This is done um, by volunteers. We are super lucky to have a lot of volunteers willing to help us out with this because there's no way we would be able to do this all on our own. Um, but the thing is, we came up with this um, and other states have independently come up with their own uh, mobile survey routes. So it makes it really difficult to compare our data because we all do it a little bit different. So um, we do our routes, for example, in July, we run them three times uh, during the month of July. And there might be other states that do them in June. Um, our routes are 30 miles. There might be people that do shorter, you know, 10 mile routes. And so everybody around us is doing the sampling, but they're doing it a little bit different. So a couple of years ago, there was a new network that was established called the North American Bat Monitoring Network. And their goal is to get everybody in North America basically on the same page, doing the same protocol so that we can um, do much more powerful analyses. So not only can we look locally at what's going on in Ohio, but then I can compare that data regionally or even across all of North America to figure out um, how the, the bat populations are changing. What are the patterns here? So we think that's really important. We think it's a great effort. We've been participating a little bit um, and they're not just doing this with acoustics, they're doing it with hibernacula surveys and roost monitoring. They really just want all the bat researchers to be doing the same thing so that we can get the most out of all this great data that we're collecting. Uh, so going back to this map again, there are some green squares on here. So the way that the North American Bat Monitoring Network works, all of North America is gridded into these 10 by 10 kilometer cells. And they have um, mathematically you know, randomly figured out that some of them are or designated some of them as priority cells. So those are the ones that you see there in green. And those are the ones they want us to focus on. And you know, based on the fact that we're not gonna be able to monitor every single one of these cells in Ohio, the ones we are going to focus on setting up new acoustic routes are, are in the, the green areas. So if you live in a green cell or near a green cell, and I apologize, there's really no like city reference on this map anywhere, but um, I'm happy to talk with people later if, if they think they might be near something. Um, so our plan is to basically scrap all those red routes. We got 10 years of really great data from those, and we're going to uh, just change over to this, this new network. So we have, at this point, nobody involved. So there's a lot of really great opportunity. Um, if you want to be involved in this program, again, I'll share my contact information where you can contact me. Um, and so if I know I've got somebody in cell, I don't know, 1019 <laughs> who wants to do a survey, then uh, I'll set one up there. You know, if I have somebody that's already over there and willing to do it, um, then that's where we'll start setting up our routes. Um, so I heard somebody, was there a question? <laughs> no. Uh, okay. You, yeah, go ahead and finish up, Sarah. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm almost done here. <laughs> um, so yeah, so there's a lot of re really great opportunity for you guys to get involved. Essentially, um, is a little bit more of a commitment than the, um, the roost monitoring. Um, if you do this, you know, hopefully you'll participate year after year. Essentially, we can do this in the month of June or July, but you're going to have one week, and that's going to be the same week every year. So if it's the first week of June that you do the survey next year, it's always going to be the first week of June. During that week of June, you're going to do two surveys, so two instead of three. They're going to be a little bit shorter. Our current routes are 30 miles. These routes are only going to be, I think, between 15 to 25, um, but it is late at night. So it starts at 945 at night, and then you have to drive really slow, so I think you drive 15 miles an hour. Um, so it'll take you about two, two hours. So if you're a night owl, you don't mind being out driving around at night, <laughs> um, then this is something that, that you could get involved in. So if it doesn't sound great, maybe think about the roost monitoring project. But um, again, there's gonna be lots of opportunity for somebody to get involved with this uh, if they're interested. And, and again, the, ma the major benefit of this is just to help us understand both locally and at larger scales, like how our bat populations are changing. And in my last two slides here, I just want to share some educational resources for you guys um, for, for further learning. And I think Anne has also shared a lot of this stuff um, in the Zoom link as well. Um, but Bat Conservation International is a great organization to learn about um, just bats in general uh, and bats in other parts of the world. Um, we have, have an Ohio bat working group that's been active for a number of years, but essentially uh, before was just, we were meeting annually. It's, it's um, rehabbers and researchers and agency professionals, anybody who's interested in bat um, conservation and bat work can join this group. But we've made a lot of effort in the last um, year or so to, to be more active, to start producing materials that people want. So one of those questions that uh, Anne is gonna have in the evaluation is um, what types of materials would help you guys? So we did send out a survey to educators. You might have, uh, might have run into that, but if you didn't, this is a great, uh, a great opportunity for you to tell us what kind of things that you want to see. So 
we're thinking about making some little like almost like playing card sort of things that talk about the bats of Ohio. So you'd have a set of cards for each bat. Um, we did produce a habitat management guide. People were really interested in um, how can we enhance our habitat to uh, around our, our property for bats. So we produced that. Um, people are really interested in bat house materials. So we're working on a bat house um, guide. So we really wanna know what's gonna help you guys be better educators um, and what do people wanna see? So I've included a little screenshot of our bat working group website um, tabs just to go through. We've got a tab on bat week here. If you click on bat week, um, you're gonna get a series of videos. So we produced uh, like 10 videos that cover topics from bat houses, gardening for bats, annual cycle of bats, bat biology. Um, and what we had in mind for those is that you guys can go uh, and watch those videos and kind of prep. If you've got a presentation coming up and feeling a little rusty on your bat facts, um, you can go to this bat week tab. We've got a set of videos there you can watch um, and to, to kind of help you refresh your, your, um, your memory there. Coexisting with bats, we've got stuff about bat exclusions on there. Um, educator resources is a great list that we put together. Um, if you are a teacher, you need um, projects, you need curriculum, you need activities related to bats. There's a lot of stuff there. Um, that get involved tab I'll talk about in the next slide, but that's basically where you can um, get involved in that roost monitoring project or um, find my contact information to talk to me about the this, uh, mobile surveys. And then habitat management, I, I think Anne linked to this, um, but if you can't find it, go to the habitat management tab there. And that's where our habitat management guide is that we just um, produced and contact information for foresters or anybody else who can come out and help you come up with a plan for your, for your land. So lots of really great information on that new website and we're really trying to push it. We have a Facebook group as well where we're posting things. So that's a great resource for um, bats in Ohio. Uh, and then just a couple other ones at the bottom here, batweek.org. Um, Batweek was last week, I think, but their website works all the time. They've got a lot of great activities. They have a lot of handouts there that you can print if you've got programs. Um, whitenosyndrome.org is a great resource, obviously, to learn about white nose syndrome. And then Project EduBat is another one that has curriculum and has projects if you're doing uh, things for school or doing activities. And this is my last slide here. Um, I don't know what time it is. How long have I gone on here? <laughs> um, yeah, so you can uh, go to that Get Involved tab and talk to me uh, uh, with my email address here. So sorry, I went way over my time. <laughs> I just noticed that. <laughs> So happy to stick around and answer uh, any questions that you guys have put in the chat or that you have for me. Yeah, I want to thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I think it really brought home, first of all, the amazing ecology and photographs. Um, but for me, the importance of the Ohio Certified Volunteer Naturalist work. And we really appreciate the time you took to really uh, bolster that and present these great opportunities coming up this summer. We could certainly see the importance um, I know folks uh, may have to peel off. We'll go to 1130. It's a little longer than normal, but I think it uh, really was a great presentation to be that comprehensive. Um, so if people want to, if uh, Nicole, you don't mind, stop recording and we'll